once again. A warm welcome to this, which is the last of our reflections on prayers of the New Testament. It is befitting that as we find ourselves in Easter week that our final reflection is upon Jesus in Gethsemane and that final time of prayer before his betrayal and arrest. As previously, you may find it helpful to have a Bible open at Matthew 26 and we'll be working from verses 36 to 46, but it's not entirely necessary. After the Passover meal, after Judas had left the upper room, they all went together to one of their favourite places, Gethsemane. Like everything in scripture, this was no coincidence. The Mount of Olives upon which the garden sat is a place of considerable import in the history of Israel. Just three quick examples, if I may, which I think have a bearing upon this event and the prayer that we find within it. The first one is Solomon. Solomon built an altar on this high place, upon this mountain. We read the story in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 7 to 11. It was designed to worship other gods. As astonishing as it may seem, he did it to placate the foreign wives that he married in defiance of God. The altar was for the gods Chemosh and Molech. Appallingly, they both demanded and received child sacrifices. God was angry because Solomon had turned away from him and he declared that the kingdom would be torn from Solomon. And here, Jesus would come to do battle with these demons and false gods once again. The second is Solomon's father, King David. David and his followers came here as they retreated from, Abs Ab from Jerusalem when his son Absalom betrayed him in 2 Samuel 15. Absalom led an uprising to topple David from the throne and it's an interesting parallel as Jesus too was betrayed by one close to him and trusted. Even more than that, David went up the mountain weeping and barefoot to seek God's will for him. David was at a crossroads moment, having been betrayed and seeking what God would have him do, just like Jesus. Thirdly, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah prophesied that a day of the Lord is coming when the Lord would stand upon the Mount of Olives ready for battle and be king over the whole earth. It's hard to say whether this prophecy relates directly to this event but it is very revelation-like in its imagery and there is no doubt that Jesus fought a mighty spiritual battle here in his prayers for the moment. And so, on arrival at Gethsemane, he gave his disciples the instruction to sit while he prayed. It's clear from his later comment that he wished them to pray, if not with him, then at least alongside him. This is one of the most joyous things that we can do for one another. And if we cannot pray together in the same place, for whatever reason, we can pray alongside others, maybe not physically, but in the act of prayer in unison, there is a sense of support and unity and standing together that Jesus appears to have craved here. Jesus takes with him the inner circle of Peter, James and John. He takes them to one side to be close to him as he prays. To them, he reveals something of his heart as he is sorrowful and troubled. What? The one who fought Satan in the wilderness, who dealt with legion, raised the dead, calmed the storm, was troubled? More than that, he said he was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he revealed this deepest thing to his closest friends. Again, here may be something that we can learn to open ourselves honestly to one another, revealing our failures and our fears, in order that we can lay them before God together for his will to be worked in them and through them. 
This is not ever done lightly. Notice that Jesus only took those who were closest to him to one side. He recognised their limitations. After all, he had just told Peter of his approaching triple denial, but he also appreciated their friendship. We must be aware of the privilege it is to be chosen by others to share their anguish and concerns. Jesus' request of them was simply to stay awake and keep watch, to support, to uphold, to just be with Jesus at this time was all he wanted and often all we need from each other. It is in these actions we see the humanity, the humanness of Jesus, wanting the comfort and support of his friend's presence. They could do little to lighten what was to come, but just being there would be enough. For at this point, Jesus is not some kind of superhero walking into his destiny with a clear eye and a straight back. Neither was he some kind of heroic Socrates figure calmly drinking his hemlock death sentence as a final lesson to his pupils. At least, that's how Socrates is portrayed in his last moments. No, Jesus, by his own admission, is troubled, sorrowful to the point of death. So now, he moves a little further. And then, in verse 39 it says, He fell with his face to the ground. If you were with us last time, you may remember considering our posture as we pray. Jesus has prostrated himself before the Father, or at the very least is knelt with his face in the dirt. It is a position of absolute humility and submission, a position that would have been very familiar to a slave approaching their master. At that moment, there seems to be a sense of utter subservience exhibited by Jesus as he approaches the Lord God, his Father. All this preparation for one little prayer, the separation ensuring no interruption, the choosing of prayer companions, the honest revealing of one's heartfelt concerns, the recognition of our place before God, all before a single syllable of prayerful supplication is uttered. Of course, we need not do all these things every time we come to pray, but the underlying mindset it demonstrates will bring us to the Father's throne with the right attitude of heart to receive from him and to offer our prayers to him. There are, of course, also times when this depth of preparation is absolutely the appropriate way to go. And yet, it is such a little prayer. But it is a prayer that develops in its emphasis as it is prayed. It starts in verse 39 with the words, if it is possible. It is as if Jesus still harbours the hope that there is another way, still another option to sidestep the cross. It's almost as if Jesus is looking into the depths of all those false gods and demonic forces that were worshipped upon that hill by Solomon and his wives. And he sees just how deep he will have to go to find victory through the cross. Especially as we see his image of the passing cup. The cup in scripture is used in two ways. It's a means of expressing the blessings or disasters appointed to a person's life. For example, in Psalm 23 verse 5, the psalmist says, My cup runs over. Or it can be a person's divinely appointed destiny. And for Jesus, it seems clear that the latter is intended. And none of the mentions of a cup in this context is present. Psalm 60 and 75, Isaiah 51, Jeremiah 25, Obadiah 16 and Revelation 14. Please excuse the list, but every one of them speaks of the wrath and the anger of God being poured out. And this prayer is reminiscent of the prayer he taught his disciples, one line of which can be translated, Don't let us be brought into the time of testing, the time of deepest trial. 
This was the cup that Jesus desired to pass him. No wonder he was troubled, overwhelmed with sorrow unto death. Even in the depth of his plea, even as a son pleading with his father, there was still the recognition that the father has the right to say no. How often is it that we come to God with our prayers and we have already decided the answer we want, even the answer that we will accept. And then when we don't get what we want, we stamp our foot and step away from prayer believing that God doesn't listen to me or that prayer doesn't work. If we, just for a moment, consider that petulant attitude and response, surely we will see just how presumptuous and childish we can be with our prayers. Having offered that first anguished prayer, Jesus returns to his disciples. And from his words to them, we see that this short first prayer may have taken as long as an hour to pray and pour out to his father. It's apparent that he is disappointed that the big strong fishermen used to working in their nets all night in cold and wet and rain and storms could not stand with him in prayer for just one hour. Here is a reminder that prayer is not merely the speaking of words but an involvement, an engagement of our whole being sometimes requiring discipline and perseverance and steadfastness and like a human muscle needs exercise and practice without which as Jesus reminds us it may be overcome by the weakness of the flesh. When Jesus returns to prayer for the second time in verse 42 his prayer although using similar words has changed in its emphasis it is as if, having a break from prayer after the first hour, he has reflected upon his words and his heart. The negative construction of his prayer now, which begins, if it is not possible, infers that he is more resigned to the task ahead of him than he was previously. Like David, retreating from Jerusalem, he has come betrayed barefoot and weeping, standing at a crossroads, genuinely seeking God's next step for him and for the people in his care. The fact that Jesus' next step is to death is what he is now wrestling with. Once again, the caveat to his request is subtly different. It moves from a reticent, but as you will, in verse 39, to a more positive, May your will be done, in verse 42. There is a sense here that the Father's will and purpose will be that which is accomplished. Again, there is a flashback to the prayer taught to the disciples, Thy will be done. It is as if all these moments, all he has taught his disciples with the Lord's Prayer and all the parables, and also to the multitudes in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere, all this is now laying upon his shoulders and coming true in him. He could only have the right to speak all these things that he taught to Israel in public if he had fought and won this battle in private, just like his post-baptism fight with Satan in the wilderness. But this time he would not achieve the right to live and teach, but the right to die. And save. Jesus once again turns to his companions and again finds them asleep. But when he goes back to his father, it is now as if he has fought and won that great battle that Zechariah foretells. For as he prays a third time to the father, he then withdraws with a new sense of resolve and purpose. He declares to the disciples, the hour has come, let us go. This is in complete contrast to his repeated assertion through John's Gospel in chapter 4, 7 and 8 that my time is not yet. Now he is clear. 
and he goes to meet his betrayer. There is so much for us here, so much for us to recognise, both the privilege and the responsibility that comes with prayer for and with others and ourselves. Our need to come with humility and openness of heart, to be ready to accept our loving Father's answer, even if it is the answer that we do not want, but then to have the courage to go forward in his will. For according to the Lord's Prayer that he taught us, it is his will, not ours, that will be done, and it will be done on earth in the same manner that it is done in heaven. And also it is his kingdom, his power and his glory that are to be seen in all that we do, not ours. And it is here that we close our times of reflection on the New Testament prayers together. It's been quite a journey from the Magnificat and the Nunc Dimittis to Gethsemane. I trust that somewhere along the way you have found a place where you can draw closer to him. He who in the words of the hymn of the name of Jesus is named as our Saviour, our Captain and our Lord. And so, until the time we meet again, may God be with you.